Oh, here it is. Today, we're going back through my old videos again. Since my last video on gadget bonds and monorails got such an interesting response, and because maglevs got popular again all of a sudden, I thought I'd share with you my ride on the Shanghai Maglev in 2013. At the time, I was on a study abroad trip with BYU, and we were exploring the mega projects of China, including the world's biggest dam, some of the world's tallest skyscrapers, the most extensive metro networks, and a ride on this, the world's fastest train. That title comes with a few qualifiers, which I'll get to in a minute. Now, the maglev in Shanghai was built as a demonstration route and opened in 2002. It runs from a transit center on the outskirts of the urban core all the way out to the Shanghai Pudong International Airport, a distance of 18.6 miles. At top speed, it will cover this distance in only seven minutes. You can probably tell that this train was designed for much longer journeys, with an airline-style seating in a 3 plus 3 configuration. There is also a business class with 2 plus 2 seating, which, thanks to the generous width of Chinese high-speed trains, still gives you plenty of space to yourself. There's the switch. <laughs> Here we are, leaving the Longying Road station, headed to the airport. When the train is at the station, it rests on its track. But just a moment before the maglev gets going, you can feel the entire train rise up just a little bit as the tracks energize. The train is lifted up by electromagnets under the track, which hold the train up about a centimeter above the guideway. The same electromagnets also push the train forward, just like a launching roller coaster. The train was much smoother than a roller coaster, and precise electronic controls are needed to energize just the right sections of the track in the correct sequence. Even though this train has a human driver, it is still very much a smart track, dumb train system. This is advertised as a feature, not a bug. Since the track controls the train, it is nearly impossible for two trains to collide. Shows how fast we're going. Almost 200 kilometers an hour already. Already we're going faster than, than the other train. And now at the end you can see the cabs. Here on this side. Very smooth. I spoke a little soon there when I said it was perfectly smooth. As we really got going, the train began to shake just a little, sort of like an airplane rolling down a runway, but not nearly so intense. The average speed of an airplane taking off is between 160 and 180 miles per hour, and the train is going just about that fast right now. Once we reach top speed, we'll be going 268 miles per hour, or about 100 miles per hour faster than an airplane taking off. Some conventional trains have traveled faster for test runs or record attempts, but no other train ever sold tickets to the general public for trips at this speed. Therefore, the fastest train the public could ride was not a conventional high-speed train, but a maglev monorail. In 2021, the maglev reduced its speeds for regular operation to a mere 186 miles per hour, but hopefully, one day, they will bring back the higher speed. The practical top speed of these maglevs is thought to be around 500 kilometers an hour, or nearly 350 miles per hour, matching the record held by the TGV. But while that record-breaking run had the train using special wheels, a special short train, and no passengers on board, the maglev is designed to go that fast in regular service, unmodified, and in theory could go even faster. But this is all theoretical, because no test track was ever built that was long enough to reach those speeds. This is at the maximum speed, 267. This is the 
maximum speed on the back of 267 miles an hour. Just to provide some context here, 268 miles per hour is fast enough to get from Salt Lake City to Las Vegas in 90 minutes. At the maglev's theoretical top speed of 350 miles per hour, you could get from Salt Lake City to Los Angeles in less than two hours. These are crazy numbers. It's just like flying, but on the ground and using only electricity as an energy source. Short flights, like the two trips I just mentioned, are absolutely terrible for the environment. The amount of jet fuel it takes to lift a heavy airplane up thousands of feet into the air is just depressing. <laughs> Maglevs, however, burn no fuel at all, and the amount of electricity they use is pretty comparable to what a conventional high-speed train would need. Maglevs don't touch their track, unless they are making an emergency stop, and so the track requires very little maintenance, and aside from wind noise, the maglevs are practically silent. The only mechanical systems on the train are the air conditioning and the doors. Everything else is controlled by electronics and software. Because magnetic propulsion is so much stronger than the friction force between steel wheels and steel rails, maglevs can climb crazy steep hills. The steepest high-speed rail line in the world is currently in Germany, and features a 4% grade. Brightline West in California is planning a short section of 5% grade, but will only be able to do so at slow speeds. Slow in this case meaning less than 100 miles per hour. The steepest grade on the US interstate highway system is 7% on I-70 west of Denver. Now, the Transrapid Maglev system was designed to be able to climb slopes of up to 10%, and could theoretically go even steeper, though that brings up some considerations for passenger comfort. The goal is not to go through mountains using expensive tunnels, like high-speed trains currently require. Instead, the Maglev can just go up and over, while at the same time maintaining its amazing top speed. At those high speeds, curvature could become a major problem. On conventional high-speed trains, curves are allowed to bank only a couple of degrees. If a train came to an emergency stop on an overbanked curve, the train could tip over and derail. But on the Transrapid Maglev, the train wraps around its track like a roller coaster and is held in place around those curves by strong electromagnetic fields. You'll notice that some of these curves here are amazingly slanted, more than you could ever do with a train or even a car. By tilting the track so much, you can run at high speeds even while making comparatively sharp curves. So, with all of these technical advantages, why aren't more maglevs being built? The main reason people usually cite is cost, which is a little misleading. The cost of maglevs are either comparable or even cheaper than a typical high-speed rail line thanks mostly to the lack of tunneling and more relaxed curve requirements. Instead, the problem lies mostly in the operation. A typical high-speed rail line can also host regular commuter trains. In between the high-speed trains, these slower trains can make stops at smaller communities along the line and thus spread the benefits of the rail line directly to the people who live next to it. The best example is the Caltrain electrification project between San Jose and San Francisco, which was constructed partially with high-speed rail money, since in the future, the commuter trains and high-speed express trains will share tracks. You could say that thousands of people are already riding California high-speed rail every day, because that project benefits so many tangential projects besides just high-speed express trains. It isn't impossible for maglevs to offer both local and express service, but the question becomes, why would you want a local maglev service when there is already a local train service that is already good enough? The only time a maglev system would create additional value is in a situation where a high-speed rail line was already at capacity, where no more commuter trains were allowed, and still the high-speed trains are full. That is the situation in Japan, between Tokyo and Nagoya, where, surprise surprise, they are building a maglev. Theirs has a different design, involving retractable landing gear, and their challenging terrain prompted them to build most of it within a tunnel, 
but otherwise, it is conceptually similar to the transrapid system that I got to ride on. So, the answer I have for maglevs is the same as I gave last time for monorails. There is no underlying technical flaw. There is only a lack of demand. Perhaps in a future where jet fuel is taxed instead of subsidized, we will see a return to solutions like maglevs instead of short-haul aviation. Perhaps when our urban cores are allowed to grow and densify, instead of being handicapped by parking garages, we will see greater demand for mass transportation between city centers. But until these trends change, I am sad to say that the Shanghai Maglev will remain, for us, a curiosity, enjoyed only by tourists and dreamers. I'm Christian Lenhart. Thanks for watching.